I'll reconvene our meeting of August 18th, and next we'll be hearing from uh, Northeastern and the Northeastern team on their budget submission. Um, I'll turn it to Mr. McCracken to get the identities and names of the uh, participants from Northeastern and to swear in the witnesses. And then Mr. Tester, I'll turn it to you and your team for your opening statements. Sounds good. Great, thank you, uh, Chair Foster. <clears throat> Sorry, for the NBRH team, um, could you let us know who uh, will be um, presenting and answering questions today? Sure, we'll give you the names of everybody here in the room. Could do, obviously, who answers the question will depend on the question, but um, we have uh, Mary Parent, our board chair. You have myself, Sean Tester, CEO. Uh, Andre Bissonnette, our chief financial officer. Betty Ann Guatkin, our chief HR yeah, officer. Can slow down. You want her to slow down? You want me to slow down? <laughs> yes, thank you. I can take as much time as you well, need. If you could spell those names for me, I think we might uh, become best friends. So that would be a great appreciation. Spell the names. <laughs> oh, man, you're going out on a limb here. Okay, so uh, let, I'll go back to uh, Andre, A N D R E. Bissonette, B I S S O N N E T T E. That's a lot of Scrabble letters in his <laughs> last name there. But um, Betty Ann Guatkin is uh, Betty, B E T T Y A N N G W A T K I N. Then we have Dr. Michael Roos, our chief medical officer, and that his last name is spelled R-O-U-S-E. S-I-C. S-I-C, whoops. I use so many S's in Andre's <laughs> name. That I, um, <laughs> um, let's see, Julie Schneckenberg. This is a mouthful, holy cow. Could we have simpler names? Um, Julie uh, is our chief nursing officer, and her last name is spelled S C H. N E C K E N B U R G E R. Uh, remotely and on the phone, we have Laura Newell, and that's N E W E L L. She's VP of Medical Practices and Operations. She's joining us from a remote location on vacation in Vermont. Uh, we have Diana Gibbs. VP of Marketing and Community Health Improvement, and her last name is spelled G-I-B-B-S. And then last but not least, we have Sean Burroughs, our Chief Information Officer, the younger, better looking Sean, S-H-A-W-N-B-U-R-R-O-U-G-H-S. I think that covers all of us. How do you spell your surname? Oh, uh, Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Tester, T-E-S, S and Sam, T-E-R. Thank you. All right. <clears throat> uh, thanks very much. I will uh, swear you all in uh, together if you could all raise your right hands. Do you solemnly swear that the evidence you shall give relative to the cause now under consideration shall be the whole truth and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. I do. I do. Okay. Uh, thanks very much, and we will uh, turn the presentation over to you. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, we'll try to be as brief as possible, but there are a couple of things we want to cover uh, in our uh, preamble. So first off, I want to say uh, we're very pleased to be here today presenting our fiscal year 24 budget and answering your questions. This budget is the result of months of work by the NVRH team with the full support of our board. It represents what is necessary for our community's hospitals to best serve our patients, ensure sustainability, and invest in our workforce. We do appreciate the challenging role that you play as regulators and are deeply appreciative of the support we have received from the Green Mountain Care Board staff as we prepared for today. The mission of, I'm sorry, what was that? Hold and get him a new skirt, new shirt for the first day of school. Even though he's no way to mute them, is there? Um, is there a guest on from MSR? I, I just I muted just... it. I think we're good. Thank oh, you. Okay, thanks. <laughs> uh, 
Um, the mission of NVRH is being committed to the improving the health and well-being for all. And we currently have the following focus areas. Meeting the increasing healthcare needs of an aging population, addressing the mental health needs of our communities and healthcare workers, targeting underlying health-related social needs, including food and housing insecurity, continuing stabilization efforts to ensure the ongoing sustainability of local healthcare services, and completing a robust strategic planning process in partnership with our board and stakeholders. We, as an institution, are committed to collaboration and value-based care. We are a regional leader for the ACO and Blueprint for Health. We're the backbone organization for NEK Prosper, our local accountable community for health. We're dedicated to collaboration with partners, including Northeast Kingdom Human Services, Home Health and Hospice, Northern Counties Healthcare, our local FQHC, the Council on Aging, Northeast Kingdom Community Action, Umbrella, RCT, our Regional Transportation Authority, the Vermont Food Bank, and more. We are also providing leadership for community health improvement and team-based care. We're committed to making impactful community investments through such tools as Community Connections, our, our outreach arm of the hospital, NEK Prosper, the Community Health Fund, our Healthy Sense Fund, and our Unhoused Partnership. We're dedicated to collaboration, collaborative partnerships to improve healthcare access, including Dartmouth-Hitchcock Cardiology Services here at the hospital, our partnership with North Country Hospital, including the Sleep Center and other regional opportunities that we are currently exploring, ENT and allergy services with Littleton Regional Healthcare, Northern Express Care with Northern Counties Healthcare, and our partnership with the UVM Pathology Lab. These partnerships enable us to support a thriving, healthy community. And now I'm gonna turn it over to my team to share some of that work with all of you, starting with Diana. Um, all right, I want to speak to community and our mission just a bit more. So, addressing that so sorry, Ms. Gibbs, we can't hear you. Sure. Uh -huh. All right. Hopefully this will be better. Um, so just speaking to addressing mental health and substance use disorder from our community perspective, um, as a leader, MDRH um, really provides community health improvement opportunities addressing gaps across the continuum of care and facilitating efforts that address health inequity experienced by our population. MDRH continuously monitors the needs of our patients and communities and in turn develops collaborative solutions, both working internally and with our health and human service partners that Sean Tester had already highlighted. Um, that said, we use data-informed approaches and a collaborative approach in addition to determine how best to allocate resources that we have, um, such as community grant opportunities and our community benefit spending. Um, so some specific areas that we wanted to highlight are maintaining a contract since 2018 with the local recovery center to ensure recovery coach services um, within 30 minutes to patients presenting in our emergency department. Um, really helping to address the vulnerable needs of, of the population here, offering brief intervention and referral to treatment. Um, we also provide in-kind space, including rent and utilities for local recovery center, our local recovery center, a comprehensive care clinic providing care and treatment for HIV and hepatitis C, as well as Vermont Cares um, that provides harm reduction services to our community, including Narcan distribution and free syringe service programming. Um, we also offer on-site sharps and medication drop boxes for safe disposal. Um, we also serve as the administrative entity for the Blueprint for Health in our health service area, offering pregnancy intention initiative services, supporting the hub and spoke model in access to medication assisted treatment that are known as medications for opioid use disorder, in integration of community health team staffing to include community health workers, care coordinators, and care managers. NVRH has also integrated behavioral health specialists into our three rural health clinics to meet those short-term counseling and behavioral health change support needs for our community. Um, to meet greater demands for mental health support, NVRH has integrated telepsychiatry for emergent access 
and recently, recently expanded the emergency department to offer a more conducive space in our mental health support area. Thank you. Next, we're gonna pass it over to uh, Betty, Ann, and Julie to talk about our workforce, uh, where we're at today, and some of the opportunities we have ahead of us. I'm Betty, Ann, um, thank you. Uh, just some highlights on um, the workforce at NBRH. Uh, we have, uh, we're a small hospital, as you know, uh, we have 715 employees or 517 FDEs. Our, um, our vacancy rate overall um, is actually quite good. It's 7.75% uh, as compared to Northeast averages of 11%. And our turnover overall hospital-wide um, is 13.5% as compared to a Northeast average of 21%. Uh, when you look at nursing, though, that's where our, um, our biggest challenges uh, are right now. Our RN vacancy rate, uh, just looking at the RN population, is 21% as compared to the Northeast average of 23%, so we're more in line with the Northeast average. Uh, and our RN turnover is 12% as compared to 16.9% um, Northeast average. Uh, we think that some of the RN turnover, uh, it may be a little um, uh, low because we do have registered nurses who um, leave permanent positions and become per diem. So they're still employees, but they're not in their permanent positions. 75% um, of those vacancies of our openings um, are in nursing. So we do have some openings in lab and food service. Um, in some various other areas, but 75% of our openings are in nursing, so uh, that's why we're focusing on nursing mostly today. Um, even normal turnover um, can create a longer-term vacancy because there are so many vacancies. The one person who retires or has to move uh, for family reasons, um, that just adds to the, um, to the bigger picture of the vacancies that we have here. Um, the impact of those vacancies for MVRH, um, we're utilizing travelers like everybody else is in um, numbers that we never saw before, um, absolutely before COVID. Um, and um, we used to use travelers for uh, maybe family medical leave or if someone was um, going to take a leave of absence, but now we have um, 26 travelers uh, on site at a cost of $3.2 million so far this year. There are other uh, well-documented uh, impacts of the nursing vacancies, not just here, but uh, burnout for nurses, nurse dissatisfaction and stress regarding the level of care. Um, the dissatisfaction and stress uh, we hear about, um, and it's mainly to do with the nurses who have stuck it out with us, and they are um, disappointed that they um, they feel like they want to do more and they could do more with each and every patient, but they're spread too thin at times, and that leads to dissatisfaction um, at the end of the day. Um, another impact of the vacancies are the limits and risk to patient care. So sometimes we, um, we try not to do this, but if we have to limit um, bed capacity, that, um, that helps to uh, mitigate the risk to patient care, and we try not to do that. Um, so these are um, obviously short and long-term issues, and we have short and long-term strategies to try to uh, solve these problems. And some of our short-term strategies have to do with wages. Um, in the last two years, uh, we focused on nursing, and um, we had wage increases hospital-wide, but we did a total of 18% wage increase for nursing um, in the last two years. We look at all hospital averages and specific rates. Uh, UVM Medical Center publishes their wage ranges, which we appreciate very much. We compete with all hospitals. It doesn't matter the size. Any nurse can go to any hospital. So we have to look at the, um, the going uh, rates um, for all hospitals combined. There's also uh, some challenges uh, regionally with high rates in nursing homes and long-term care facilities, as well as the prison and home health. Um, those facilities have real challenges and they're really important jobs. Uh, so they will, um, those rates spike quite often and um, 
we hear about it from uh, nurses who are actually interviewing and looking um, around. So we, um, we have to pay at least market rates. The, um, the rates are rapidly changing. Um, and for example, as I said, the, the nursing offers from other facilities are um, absolutely 20% over what the surveys say, and we have to rely on the surveys to set our wages. Um, CRNAs, uh, our certified registered nurse anesthetist recently, um, their wages are increasing in the state, and uh, we had to do a market, in a substantial market increase for the CRNAs. Uh, some other um, short-term strategies, uh, we've increased clinical support um, for nurses, so you can't fill the RN role, so we have um, replaced some of the RN roles with uh, clinical support such as LNAs and, um, and then LPNs uh, who are uh, two-year um, nurse, nurse professionals. And um, we also, uh, through our recruiting um, uh, initiatives, we've uh, enhanced our outreach efforts, uh, online targeted ads. Uh, we have started a short apply process, which makes our application process a little um, quicker. And um, we have um, worked with Indeed and, and our recruitment system uh, to do career and resume searches through them as well. Um, we've also pursued international staff like a lot of other hospitals do. Um, for us, we don't qualify for the H-1B um, visas because we're not a teaching facility. And we also allow nurses to have two-year degrees rather than four-year degrees. Um, although um, we have pursued uh, green card um, um, employees uh, and supported the green card process, but those visas are, um, have already met their cap nationally. So um, that's not an option for us right now. Um, and then quickly for our retention, um, we do, um, we're a small place. So we're fortunate that we can talk directly to people quite often and through um, the feedback from staff, we've improved our staffing patterns. Uh, we discuss work-life balance, more creative scheduling. Um, uh, everyone is looking uh, for professional development. It's not always about the money for the existing employees especially. Um, and then they also offer us recruitment ideas. We've leveraged uh, insider travel contracts. We developed an insider travel um, program, an insider traveler program, which Julie has shared uh, with other hospitals across the state. Um, and we have never utilized sign-on bonuses, and we're continuing to do so because we, um, our philosophy is to focus on the permanent wage level. Um, I. I'm Julie Schneckenberger. Uh, good afternoon. I'll talk a little bit about long-term strategies that we have in place. Um, we've discovered through our recruitment efforts um, that nurses prefer to talk to a nurse when they're talking about a position at a hospital. Um, so we've added a, a person that helps with development um, and is a nurse and goes with Heather to uh, nurse recruitment. Um, things we've also started recently actually today was the first day of our nurse residency program We have six nurses um, enrolled in that program. It's based on um, standards of care and We have found that the new grads over the last few years during COVID did not get the hands-on actual patient care um, clinical experience that they would have uh, under other circumstances so we want them to have a good foundation a solid um, group that they can grow with and develop. Um, we offer many of those classes to anybody that would like to attend them that wants to brush up on anything. Um, so that's all published and ready to go. Um, we have two nurses from the ED, two from med surge, and one in day surgery all enrolled in that, that program. Um, we also recently uh, started to work on a CAP program. That is our um Sorry, career advancement program, and we have six people involved in that as well. That will take someone for, from example, uh, in environmental services that will send them through an MA program. When they complete the MA program, then they can take a course and be eligible to move into an LPN program and then continue on to an RN program. We've worked with White Mountains Community College for this program 
for several reasons. They have openings where uh, Vermont State University nursing programs do not have the volume of openings that we need in this state. Um, they're 30% lower tuition for that program. Um, so we're supporting that going forward. Um, and then uh, we also work with v uh, Vermont State University for the nursing programs. We hold clinicals here for their PN and um, RN program students, and we will do the same with our White Mountains Community College um, students. We recently changed our uh, nursing education program from a decentralized, meaning that every nursing unit had an educator on that um, unit. We've centralized that um, recently, and it's making things more robust. They support one another through education programs, um, and we have standards of how we um, orient nurses to the various units. Um, and then uh, we recently, under new leadership, have redesigned how we run our medical surgical unit. Um, that was the one unit that has the most vacancies in it. Um, we've gone to a, a um, uh, sorry, <laughs> a, it's a nurse, team, team nursing, um, which is a little different than what we had. Um, we had a clinical coordinator We've removed that position and changed it to a, a resource nurse, charge nurse. This gives nurses more autonomy. We've also changed our staff, uh, patient to staff ratio from one to four to one to five, so that eliminated um, some positions and keeps us at a safe nurse patient ratio. We've also supplemented, um, when RNs have left, we've engaged LPNs and um, LNAs rather than an all RN staff. So the FTE has not changed, but the cost, if you will, for those um, care nurses are is a little bit less. So. All right, thank, thank you. you. Um, Dr. Mike Roos is going to go through some of uh, the post-acute care challenges we're seeing in our community today. I should mention it's very unusual for Dr. Roos to wear a tie, so I hope you all appreciate it. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for having me. Um, so, you know, what, what do we prepare these budgets for? It's for what we expect to see coming. So we're trying to prepare a budget that will respond to what we're going to see coming. And what we're seeing now in the Northeast Kingdom, which it has the highest percentage of elderly patients in the state of Vermont, um, is more and more trouble with um, getting patients placed. So we can um, take care of patients and get them ready for discharge, but where do they go next? And uh, what we find is we're having um, increasing problems with finding beds in skilled nursing facilities. They're having a lot of trouble with staffing, as Betty Ann mentioned. Uh, we've had two nursing homes close in our region since 2020. Um, there's quality issues in the post-acute care setting. Um, so we're really, uh, where do these patients go um, after we have taken care of their acute problems? Um, we're definitely seeing more dementia, chronic illnesses. Um, these patients have mobility issues. Having mobility issues here in the Northeast Kingdom makes it very difficult with the winters and, uh, you know, transportation issues. And the idea of aging in place is getting harder and harder here in the Northeast Kingdom. So. We're dealing with all that. We're, you know, utilizing care management services um, to the to the highest extent. Um, and what we're finding is uh, we're having to look to our neighboring state, New Hampshire, for interestingly, um, Jerry Site Care. Um, there's a Jerry Site facility in Woodsville, New Hampshire, Ray of Hope, and another one in Nashua, St. Joseph's. Uh, we don't seem to have a referral. Uh, place in Vermont for that. Um, because of the skilled nursing facility shortage in Vermont, we're using um, places like Country Village in Lancaster, New Hampshire, Lafayette in Franconia, Crafton County in North Haverhill, the Morrisons in Whitefield. Whitefield. So, um, you know, we're, we're stretched as thin as we can as far as trying to take care of the population we have. We have a lot of mental health challenges here. Um, we have one of the highest uh, 
percentage usage of our ED for mental health evaluations. Uh, we see five to 10 mental health patients in crisis each week in our ED. And um, this causes a, um, increased costs and strains our services, most of which we don't get reimbursed for. Um, we provide patient observers. Um, we've instituted a telepsych program that we basically pay for on our own because the reimbursement for those services is poor. Um, we've uh, had as many as five mental health patients in our nine bed ED at a time, which means those are five beds that are not available for acute care. Um, so we divert a certain amount of acute medical issues from our ED because of that. Um, the mental health patients in crisis do lead to increased staff turnover and strain our security staff, which we also have to pay extra for. So we have a lot of challenges trying to um, be able to take care of what we are seeing coming in. The budget we have made is to try to adapt to what we are seeing. Thank you, Michael. Yes. And then I'm going to let uh, Andre uh, wrap things up for us. So you've heard from Julie and Diana and Dr. Roos about some of our challenges, some of what we're doing, uh, some of the efficiencies and some of the cost savings, as well as some of the investments um, that we've had to make here at NBRH. Um, in Julie's uh, discussion about restructuring the uh, med surge floor, we've reduced FTEs, a little bit over six FTEs. That equates to about $600,000 a year. Uh, we've reduced some FTEs in our practices. It's, it's about four FTEs. Uh, about a year ago, we engaged with a consulting company, uh, AMS, to do labor benchmarking for us. Uh, we've started implementing that throughout this past year and look forward to implementing more of it as we go forth. Um, you know, it's starting to reap some benefits as we see the opportunities and, and look at some of their operational efficiencies and benchmarking. At the same time, with that reduction of six FTEs on the floor, uh, we've hired six new nurse residents. Um, that's going to reduce our uh, traveler expense. Uh, we've got a reduction from our actual spend right now to next year of about $1.4 million in our traveler line for that. So those are the, the hard and fast dollars that we can quantify. Uh, we've got some other things that we're looking at too that we're doing. Um, we've streamlined patient insurance uh, verification process for when patients come in, uh, we can actually automatically push a button in our Meditech system and within minutes have a, an insurance verification to make sure that the patient, we have the right insurance information for those patients. That's more accurate um, claim submission and a better turnaround for our, um, our revenue cycle. Um, that, that's actually uh, helped reduce our days in AR from roughly 40 days to 32. Uh, we've implemented a contract review process for new and existing contracts, uh, new capital purchase process as well, so we can get a better handle on our purchasing uh, of capital uh, better line of sight to it. We've moved paper claims, which we've had a number of paper claims that we were dropping to an electronic claim system. Uh, and we've got, as Julie spoke about, long-term uh, investment strategy for our workforce through the CAP program. Um, that CAP program is not a, a one and done. It's not a one year. Uh, the idea is to get um, staff into the MA program. There's a, a, a launch pad for LPNs to get into an LPN program to move them to an RN. So the end game is to grow our own. Um, there's not many uh, experienced nurses out there that are able, that we're able to recruit or any other hospital that's able to recruit. They're very limited. So I think the strategy is growing your own and that's, that's where hospitals have to go at this point. Um, the, the CAP program is unique. We're not just paying for the educational component. Um, what we found when we were speaking to these MA candidates is that, and even a couple of the LPN ones that are going to start in January, that, that they could afford to go to school or get the funding to go to school, um, but they can't afford to not work and go to school. So this program actually bridges that work component. So we, we will actually be paying them for that time they're in, in class. Um, so that they can afford to live and go to school with an end game of having an advanced degree when they come out. 
So that's all that I have, so thank you. All right. Thank you all for uh, giving us an opportunity to share a little of our story this morning. All right. Well, we appreciate it. Thank you. Um, uh, Director Lindbergh, are you running this one or is this Mr. Sutter? You're stuck with me. As long as I can be, I'll take it. Go ahead, please. <laughs> All right. Uh, so thank you for the, the opening comments um, and really helpful to hear some of those um, benchmarking values uh, related to your vacancy and turnover rates. Um, I would just say that you know, that's one place we struggle is to get publicly available sources. So, you know, as we explore uh, the possibility of proprietary data sets for that kind of comparison, we look forward to hearing recommendations. Um, so overall, we see uh, that uh, among cause that Northeastern uh, for the NPR growth is clustered right here with Springfield and Grace Cottage uh, and um, right around that 16% mark, so 16.33 to be exact, with operating expense growth pretty close to that. Again, uh, relatively uh, close to Grace Cottage, so seeing some familiar, uh, some similar trajectories on operating uh, expense growth. Um, however, here we see, um, you know, tied for the first in terms of the charge master increase in the ask uh, from fiscal year 23 to 24. Uh, and, you know, hoping to recoup the majority of that um, in the actual commercial contracts. Uh, and, you know, in your narrative uh, or in your response to questions, thanks for providing those, you kind of walked us through uh, the process by how you develop that rate. And I, I thought we might just start there um, in terms of kind of how you approach that process. So I can read your response if you like, or if you want to just talk about yeah. it yourself. <laughs> Why don't you go ahead and read through it, Sarah? All right, so you say that you developed it as follows. So one, you identify a target operating margin of 1%. Um, so then after you net out any savings that you've identified, you look at your expenses um, and then look at what NPR you can expect based on your budgeted volume assumptions. Then you look at your change in uh, Medicare NPR based on those factors. Uh, know that that can be a little bit of a tricky uh, calculus, especially with the cost report um, timelines. Uh, then looking at how well, what you're expecting for other operating revenue, and I guess the wild card there uh, these days is uh, often uh, the 340B revenue and, and what you can hope to uh, recoup there. Um, and then what, when you did all that, you, you saw, hey, that's an operating loss of um, 5.45 million. Um, which is not the operating margin you were um, expecting. Uh, so then that's how you figure out that um, based on the value of your commercial rate at $446,600 per 1% of increase that you needed the 15%. Um, so that that is kind of the process that you take, right? Is Did I miss any of the steps there? Nope, I think you've captured it, Sarah. Nope, you're on mute, Sarah. Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay, so that is the process that you uh, took so we can understand where that came from. Um, and then when we look here, uh, so, you know, seeing those operating expenses, you know, among your peers, I think that you, you're, you know, kind of in this uh, above the median, but, uh, you know, not not the highest, second highest among cause, I think maybe third highest overall. So um, we heard from Grace about some of the things driving their um, operating expenses. Um, you've discussed um, some of the labor challenges. Any other kind of drivers of operating expenses you think are important for the board to understand? Yeah, there's, there's some op other operating expenses. Well, let me start with the 340B uh, retail revenue. Um, in, in the narrative, they submitted a graph of what's happened to that over the last five years um, since, I think it put 2022, but it's actually since 2000, I think it's 20, um, we had a high of $2.7 million in other operating revenue from that. We're budgeting next year um, other operating revenue of 300000 uh, So that's, you know, almost a $2.5 million delta in a very short period of time. So that's playing into the NPR uh, need. The other areas of growth, which um, you get the, the investments that we're doing in our workforce, um, both in like a, the CAP program, education, um, and, and the salary issues that Betty Ann spoke to, 
We also have increase in um, in our supply costs, mainly around um, implants. Um, we do bill for those, so I don't look at that as just a pure cost because there is revenue attached to that, as well as the, the drugs. And the drug increase is, a, a good chunk of that is around utilization, not around inflation. Um, inflation is tough to pin on the drugs. We do have a couple very high cost drugs um, that every once in a while creep in. We do have one patient that's on a regiment that's for a, a cost is about $350,000 a year. Um, we had another patient that we thought may come into the fold. We did not put that in the budget. We have not seen that patient again. Um, unfortunately for us as a critical access hospital, that drug cannot be purchased on the 340B program. If they go to a PPS hospital, because of their dish status, it can be purchased on the 340B program. Um, so those are some of the other areas of, um, of increased expenses. And of course, the provider tax ties into that, but that's a mechanism of NPR. Right, right. Um, yeah, okay. Um, and then, um, yeah, so that helps on the pharmacy costs. So yeah, you had mentioned kind of that million dollar increase, um, but we we're trying to look over the two years and I didn't quite track that, but it sounds like you should be within the range there. Um, and then, when we look at the uh, your your financial performance, um, this is kind of that that gap that I think that you're talking about. So you know, uh, in earlier years, the darker line is the operating expenses was closer to the NPR line, and I think that um, the hospital industry at large is is grappling with that. And uh, you talked about some ways you're trying to grow your own and reduce the traveler's expenses, um, and you know, seeing that total margin um, at one percent uh, looks like uh, you know lower than historical values, um, but good to see some rebound uh, in uh, projected for the current fiscal year. Um, and then uh, the day's cash on hand is certainly concerning. Um, I'm sure that's something you're tracking as well. Um, just cu curious how you're kind of trying to balance um, the need for cash versus kind of operating uh, funds flowing through the system and, and uh, kind of maybe longer term, how you're kind of thinking about restoring some reserves. Yeah, the cash has taken a dip. Um, you know, we're in that 100 days cash on hand range, which to me is marginal. Um, I like to see a much healthier days cash on hand. That's a good indicator of the strength of your balance sheet. Um, you know, looking at a 1% margin for operations is part of the strategy to, to start building that back up, um, as well as uh, keeping an eye on the money we do have in investments and making sure that those are throwing decent returns. As far as the, the NPR to expense, um, I think going back to 2019, um, you know, that gap was filled with 340B retail revenue. Um, and I think you're going to see that with many, especially critical access hospitals, where that is going to be, that gap is, is going to start um, staying open uh, when it drops to the bottom line, because that other operating revenue is not going to be there. Yep. Big yeah. pharma's chipped away pretty good at that number. Um, and then when we look at, uh, so this is compensation for FTE, uh, being a small hospital, there's just going to be a, a lot more volatility here. Um, but, you know, if we look at where you were at 101 per FTE in 2017, if we just trend that forward based on the employment cost index, we would have expected something closer to 118 in fiscal year 22. looks like uh, we're closer to 134. I do see kind of increases in salaried staff. So, um yeah, I, I think you covered pretty much how you're trying to approach the benchmarking and and, uh, and factoring in those. But um, just if you have any um, comments or or reactions you wanted to provide, I want to offer you an opportunity. Yeah, um, as far as the benchmarking goes, um, you know, most of the benchmarking data that's out there is at least a year old, and the market has changed so drastically and quickly over the last you know two and a half three years. Um, to, to keep up with that. Uh, it used to be minimum wage was $12 an hour four years ago. And, you know, we're talking and, um, you know, going back and forth. Is that going to actually end up being $15 an hour? Well, when COVID hit, it automatically went to $15 an hour. And then some um, for, for a lot of those positions that were um, 
entry level positions, but direly critical for a hospital. Um, a hospital runs on every position that we have. It's not just nursing staff, it's not just doctors. You close ORs down when you can't clean them. You close inpatient down if you do not have a cafeteria to, to serve food and create food for your patients. Um, so that, that number alone went up drastically in 2020, and it's just cascaded from there. And keeping up with the market, the way it's been going with the shortages out there, the benchmarks is something we look at, but also understanding that that benchmark's a year plus old, and how do we get in front of it so we're not that much further behind the benchmark so we have staff. I also want to remind you uh, about what Betty Ann shared. You know, if you look across our open positions, um, you know, 75% of them are nursing. We know we have a nursing problem, and 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 we've moved hard to to stay within market on nursing pay. But we've also worked really hard to keep up with market changes with all the other clinical positions uh, within a hospital. Fundamentally. You know, it is hard to recruit to a rural area like the Northeast Kingdom, and and so part of our strategy has been to to be responsive to the the rapid changes of the market, and I think that's part of the reason why you see us a little bit above benchmark. However, mm -hmm. we do not have a problem filling positions like APRNs and and, and physicians at this hospital, and and, and so. I think our, our our workforce challenges are very much contained to the nursing challenge, which we are, you know, this budget reflects an investment in our, our future nursing workforce so that we don't have that problem. But um, but I, I think you're probably going to find that, that, that the entire market is going to catch up to, to, to that to that reality here very quickly. Yeah, it seems consistent with other testimony we've had. Um, and, uh, you know, you kind of lay out your total compensation change over the two years, um, but we do see a discrepancy in the admin in general versus clinical. Um, is that, uh, can you talk me through kind of why that's different? I'm not sure. We probably have to get back to that. Yeah, I'd have to dig into that one. Okay. More, okay. No worries. Okay. Uh, I will list the follow up. And your total compensation, does that include benefits or is that salary? Total, total compensation, yes, benefits. Um, yeah. yeah. Outside that, we have seen benefit growth um, in our healthcare spend. Yeah, yeah, I imagine so. Um, so, uh, you know, again, a smaller hospital here, uh, see a lot of volatility and kind of uh, the utilization um, changes year over year. Um, I think we we connected offline that um, while this looks like a dramatic decrease from 21 to 22, it's actually only one and a half percent. So, um, you know, the scale here is a little um, deceptive. Apologies for that. Um, uh, so I guess from a budgeting perspective, knowing that you kind of have this um, hard to predict pattern and utilization, um, you know, how do you approach that as someone making these budgets? I'm sure it's not easy. Yeah, um, if you actually look at the graph, it's, I mean, this is kind of a, a funky graph for the utilization because it shows the growth from the prior year. So you'd want to actually see it go down, not drastically up. Um, if you go back to 2019, that's the pre-COVID year. Um, that, that was a drop from 2018 of 10%. Um, so our drop of 1% from last year means it's at least flattening out. Um, which, again, is an issue when our expenses are going up. Um, th there's, there's only a couple levers you can pull um, when that happens, especially given that our, a number of our um, expenses are, are fixed expenses. So utilization like that, where we've seen some increases in utilization is in our OR. Um, we've got a, a pain service, which I talked about in our narrative, which is actually... Um, pretty impressive when you actually have a service that is getting patients off of opioids. Um, you know, they're, they're, he takes long-term chronic pain patients and is able to either get them drastically weaned down and, or completely weaned off of, uh, off of medications. Um, those are the two biggest areas. We do have a little bit of increase in our uh, diagnostic imaging area, but, you know, the ER has gone up a little bit. Um, but pretty much it's flat. And yeah, when you have utilization that's relatively flat and 
a lot of times that's our demographics. Um, it becomes a challenge from a budgeting standpoint. Yeah, understandably. <laughs> um, and then um, as far as, you know, you are pretty close to a border, so um, looks like a, about the 80-20 split when it comes to in and out uh, migration for utilization. Um, just pointing out that uh, much like uh, the uh, White River Junction uh, hospital service area, which we heard is amazing and very valuable, um, the St. Jay uh, service area uh, has quite a high proportion of uh, residents with Medicare as their primary payer. Um, and I think what we see here is this big drop uh, in spending due to uh, Medicare Advantage. Um, so I'm just curious um, how you're grappling with some of the challenges associated with that uh, type of payer. Um, our, our biggest challenges with that type of payer is they're, they're, we get uh, a much greater denial rate from them. Um, one of the other things that we, we put together this year was a revenue cycle committee uh, focusing on denials, um, you know, the, the insurance verification, you know, trying to make sure that claims uh, go out the door clean and, and come back in clean. And we find that um, the Medicare Advantage ones uh, are ones that I, I don't know if it's just the insurance company or if it's confusion on the patient's part where they think they have Medicare because when they come for a visit, they still are, they do still have a Medicare product el that they're eligible for. Um, so it's picking the right insurance company and they'll come in and say, well, I've got Medicare and it's really Medicare Advantage. Yeah. So I think between, you know, they are a for-profit entity, they're not government, they're not Medicare. Um, so they, they they do act just like any other commercial insurance company, um, but I think there's a little bit of confusion that goes on, and there's you know, there's something like 120 different products out there uh, for Medicare Advantage. So it becomes very confusing for especially yeah. for patients. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so uh, it's thinking through some of these cost report metrics. So um, uh, let's see, you are uh, relatively large compared to the comparators above the 75th percentile, but um, clustered pretty closely with some of these um, other uh, facilities. Um, and your case mix index is very close to North Country at uh, 1.3. Uh, so just want to make sure that those numbers kind of make sense in terms of acuity and, and uh, relative size from where you're sitting? Yeah, they do. Um, you know, when you have adjusted discharges uh, for critical access and it, it looks like it's higher like this, um, usually it's because they're offering a, a broader um, broader amount of services. The Medicare case, admit, case mix index, which we submitted our total case mix index, which is about 1.15. Um, so the Medicare at 1.3 does make sense. Okay. And that is what I would expect. We we do have a, um, a pulmonologist on staff that helps um, helps be able to keep more acute patients in our our facility. Fantastic. Um, and you know, relatively speaking, we've got a very skewed distribution. I think we talked earlier about um, that. You know, a lot of these lower lying numbers are probably you know affiliated with systems, and that the admin and ratio is uh, not representative. But you you're right at the median here, very close to some of the other um, Vermont hospitals. Um, I don't know if you had the privilege of submitting the cost report for MVRH in fiscal year 22, but um, you know if there's any funkiness, uh, especially on line five, uh, that we should know about, it'd be a good time to let me know. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll follow up if you have anything after the, uh, later on. Yeah. Okay, and then uh, right, right near the median in terms of cash available for operations at the end of fiscal year 22, we talked a little bit about strategy there. Um, and then the um, kind of profitability measure we have, uh, you know, just barely break even. Uh, so, you know, I think that uh, 25th percentile, um, kind of a sign of the times there. Um, and then again, just really in with the rest of the pack um, at the 13,000 per adjusted discharge, which is very close to Springfield and uh, um, Grace Cottage, a little bit uh, higher than Porter. Um, any concerns about the uh, validity of the that measure or uh, concerns that we might not be getting the signal? Uh, no, uh, I haven't done a deep dive into it, Sarah, but uh, that, that looks reasonable. Okay, thank you very much. Um, and then 
The cost coverage one, uh, so uh, looking at you over time, so we see, um, you know, fairly stable, if not a little bit better cost coverage in recent years uh, among commercial insurance, obviously uh, tied to costs for the Medicare reimbursement and, and seeing this kind of drop in the, the Medicaid reimbursement that we've seen for many other hospitals. Um, I do think that, uh, you know, NVRH, um, you know, has a cost that's pretty well in line, uh, according to this analysis with other critical access hospitals, but does seem to have a little bit more favorable um, payment uh, from commercial insurers at 193% of those costs, which um, looks like might be second only to North Country. So just, um, you know, any ideas about, um, you know, why you might have relatively uh, higher reimbursement for that population? Um, other than a potential um, mix, uh, this is that's inpatient and outpatient, Sarah? Yeah, it is. Yeah, would you like to look at one or the other? Yeah, the outpatient. Okay. Oh, we can look at it separately. Yeah, so that's 242 for outpatient. What's inpatient looking like? And the so you, inpatient outpatient may be different with the other hospitals. Yeah, I see what you're saying. So, so for inpatient, you're about the middle of the pack, and for outpatient, you're uh, again second to North Country. So, do you, it, is part of it you think maybe related to the service mix and doing relatively more outpatient than other critical access hospitals? Yeah, it may be maybe related to that, and also the contracts may be a little bit different um, for outpatient between the hospitals. Okay. And it could be a little bit of a difference between the actual payer itself um, related to the contracts. Yeah. And I think, you know, as a regulator, like seeing that and then seeing one of the, the you know, the higher rate asks, I think is just something that. Um, you know, just as where we sit, just trying to figure out how to balance those things where you need your operating margin, but consumers, we don't want to um, put the undue burden on the commercial rate payers. So just need to think through kind of how to balance those very difficult things. <laughs> um, and finally, um, so the standardized. So again, if this would be take all the commercial payments you got from 18 to 22 that we had to, to, I'm sorry, 2020 that we have available in vCares and divide by a standardized unit of service. And we see NVRH uh, among critical access hospitals at the 75th percentile um, on inpatient and outpatient. So, um, you know, you know, not, you know, there are some Vermont hospitals that have uh, some higher, higher numbers here, um, but within kind of that middle 50% of the data. Um, so again, that's super old. So I think sometimes the hardest to understand what to do with. And um, Sarah, remind me what's in this, I should say, what's not in this data set? It's the self-pay plans. No, no um, self-pay, no military, no uninsured. Uh, we already covered that. No, and we're missing about half of the self-funded market. So that's a big thing that we're missing in the, the data set. Um, but we do, uh, the New Hampshire does contribute claims to this. So we would get the New Hampshire patients in here. All right, uh, I think that was all I had to cover. Any responses uh, you want to give to any of the, the metrics or information before we turn it back over to the board for questions? No, I'm good. I think so, I think we're good. Okay, great. All right, Chair Foster. All right, thank you. Um, board members, uh, please go ahead if you have comments or questions. I can start for us. Um, thank you all for coming again, our yearly ritual. Um, I have a question, I have a couple of questions. Um, not surprisingly about price and cost. So the charge master request is 15%. Um, and the way in the narrative, it talks about being allocated 16.75% for hospital-based services and 0% for medical practices. Can you just speak a little bit to the decision to do it that way? Yeah, the medical practices um, are, for the most part, a fixed 
fee schedule or in our primary care arena is an RHC fixed visit rate, um, both for Medicare and Medicaid. So if you apply a fee increase on those, there's, there's no net really that comes out of that. So it's all shifted to the hospital side. Um, and I'm wondering, so as Sarah just showed, you know, the standardized prices based on RAND, um, you're at the 75th percentile for both inpatient and outpatient. Sometimes we'll see a hospital is higher on inpatient, but then lower on outpatient. But it was noticeable to me that Northeastern was high on both. Um, I'm wondering, do you try to benchmark your prices? How do you think about your, your charge master increases? Um, you know, do you benchmark them against something yourselves to ensure the affordability for your community? How do you think about where your price increases will go each year? Um, historically, I think some of them were benchmarked um, here. I know I'm used to benchmarking pricing, um, both against uh, a couple different ways of doing it, uh, getting price data for other hospitals, particularly in the state. And I look, have looked more around other critical access hospitals and also throw in the tertiary as a, as a benchmark there. Um, also using the Act 53 website um, that's out there, using that for the actual um, overall, some of the services that are selected on that to, to benchmark it, to try and get the hospital in line with uh, at least the median uh, on some of those charges. Some of that gets to be really difficult to do to make the change um, because, uh, you know, you can change one, one lab fee that can have a, you know, $2 million bottom line impact. Um, pretty easily and, and pretty quickly. So um, they, it gets to be a little tricky, but it, it can be done. And I have done it myself in the past. So for NVRH, how close to the median target would you say NVRH is on most, the majority of most frequently used services? I have not looked, Jessica. I'd have to get back to you on that one. Um, okay. Given this, I'd say probably a little bit on the higher side, but that's anecdotal. <laughs> right. Um, and then I guess on the same, if you, uh, S Director Lindbergh, if you could go to the cost report on the cost side. Um, so you had mentioned that, yeah, that's right. That's perfect. I wanted to look at the CMI adjusted average cost per Medicare discharge. So if we look at your adjusted discharges, first of all, you're on the higher side, at least of critical access hospitals in the state. Um, in terms of numbers of discharges, um, but you're also on the higher side in terms of average cost per Medicare discharge, CMI, CMI adjusted. So you'd mentioned that you thought that the, the CMI adjustment was valid. You're also large on discharges, so you benefit from economies of scale to some degree within the, the critical access hospital um, spectrum. So I'm, I'm curious, you're at 13,000 for the cost per discharge. The median's 11,000. So um, given the benefits of your scale and the appropriateness of the CMI adjustment, I'm wondering if what you can, how you can help us understand why your costs per discharge are high and what it would take to get down to the median. Uh, without actually looking at the calculation that um, comes up with the actual adjusted discharge itself, um, I, I've been in a position where the adjusted discharge and these metrics have swung because um, it's heavily reliant on your inpatient discharge is extrapolated out against all of your outpatient services. And if you either discontinued or increased an outpatient service, it can skew that number one way or the other. So I want to actually know what's behind that adjusted discharge number before I would even come close to giving you an, an answer that. Um, I felt was valid. Um, the example is when I was at North Country and the, the, the chemotherapy program got discontinued. Um, the ad adjusted discharge number uh, went up significantly, I think it was, because the, re the revenues dropped, but there's no actual discharges associated with it. Um, you know, high, high amount of revenues and cost with a very lo low amount of visits. Uh, as a as a ratio, so I want to see what's in the adjusted number. Um, you, I, 
I always get worried with the adjusted number because it's an adjusted number. It's a backed into number from your your inpatient um, discharges. And I, I I haven't looked too deeply into this, but a lot of times when you have a, a higher outpatient mix, like an 80-20 versus a 50-50 or 60-40 uh, inpatient to outpatient um, ratio, it can change some of those numbers. And just to be clear, these actually is calculated from MedPAR claims, so it's the average uh, cost. So they recost the claims uh, in MedPAR, and then um, that average amount is divided by the the CMI. So that one, I, I hear you about adjusted discharges, oh. but that's not a factor in this particular measure. Okay. Um. Well, I would love to hear some of your, I mean, you've talked a little bit about some of your ideas for cost reduction, um, but given, you know, where you sit with the average cost per adjusted discharge here, are there things in the future that we can look forward to, um, bigger ticket items that will lower some of the costs of delivering care in your community? You want to take that one? Sure. It, it, you know, ultimately, I think it really comes down to building that nursing workforce. I, I, mean, I mean, that's where you see us making the investment in education, growing our own uh, cadre of nurses, uh, nursing professionals to replace the travelers um, within the hospital. And uh, ultimately, if we can get back to a steady state with our workforce, I think you'll see the cost inflation start to, to moderate. Okay, then I guess I, that's my last question. Um, we're trying to gather from every hospital a breakdown of the cost inflation assumptions. Um, and I, you know, in the narrative, it was a bit vague. Um, you know, the description of where the big drivers are, and you, you've talked about it a bit more today. But I'm wondering if you could submit separately as a follow up. Um, what are the cost inflation assumptions? By how much is our wages and salaries growing for MD and non MD? labor, pharmaceutical growth, pharmaceutical price growth, medical and non-medical supplies separately and purchased services, for example, any other buckets that I might have forgotten. But that is, um, it would be really helpful for us to understand where you think the biggest drivers of expense growth are um, within each of those buckets. So that can be a follow-up if you would be so willing. Yep, yep, we can do that. So you want the Great. expense growth, not just an inflation factor. Correct. Well, actually, I would love to see the inflation factor uh, because I'm trying. I would like to understand relative to what our benchmarks are for medical inflation and non-medical inflation. What are some of the assumptions that um, Northeastern is making? So I would love to see the inflation factor, um, but others might be interested in both. So both would be great. Yep, we can do that. Thank you. That's it for me. Uh, and and uh, you want the growth? I want to make sure I understand from twenty. Um, 22 actual to 24 budget is what you're looking for. I would for. love it annually. So 22 to 22 to 23 and then 23 to 24. So we can understand what's already happened and what's baked in and what is anticipated for the, uh, in the submission of this budget. Okay. 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 Any other board member questions? have a couple. Um, could you talk a little bit more on about how you think the Medicaid redeterminations are going to flow through in your community? I noted in on in your narrative on page 11, um, you weren't you didn't really include anything on uncompensated care, but I was just wondering how you're thinking about that a little more broadly in terms of pair mix shifts and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um... It's a hard thing to actually put your thumb on because we we don't even know where those patients came from. Did they come from a, a medic, uh, a Medicare, um, not Medicare, but a um, exchange plan, um, and get dropped and come over? And did they lose their job and now they're working again, um, or are they going to come off the, the Medicaid enrollment and then become self-pay? Um, those are the the three big buckets, and if they're self-pay, it could end up in um, bad, bad debt or, or charity care. Um, the numbers are still unclear uh, in total as to what the patient population would become unenrolled 
and would they be eligible um, with the next enrollment frame? Um, so it, it's a big unknown as far as I'm concerned right now. Um, the the one thing that will happen when that when that comes through is they will fall out of our attributed life um, calculation for the ACO. That is the one thing we know. We just don't know the numbers. Um, it, that said, I mean, we have a lot of great systems, community connections. We've got a, a lot of resources in place to help people with their insurance options as they go through this uh, disenrollment, re-enrollment process, right? So uh, I think um, the systems we have that we've had in place for years are, are well positioned to help people navigate this. Thanks. Hi, this is Dave Merman. I have a few questions. Um, really appreciate the work you're doing on reducing traveler cost and travel utilization. And um, it, there are some comments. I don't remember if they were in your presentation or earlier today, but the the complex uh, impact on team morale with travelers sometimes it benefits to unload, but other times it's it's pretty um, destabilizing. So I, I think trying to grow your own. Um, bring as many, have as many uh, nurses you can locally that stay, that are invested in your organization to make it a thriving organization, keep it a thriving organization is great. Um, can I just ask one question? You said there's tuition opportunities for nursing programs. Uh, is that that the hospital's paying tuition for nurses to go to nursing school? What, what could you just give a little bit more information on that? Okay. Um, the the program uh, is for the tuition is that we will either help the student get the loan uh, or they would pay for it. Most of them can't afford to pay for it. So they're reaching through VSAC and we've contacted a local bank to help any of those uh, individuals out who couldn't actually get a, a full loan through VSAC. So the idea is they get the loan, go through the schooling in year one, correct me if I'm wrong, Betty Ann, we would pay off half of their loan, and in year two, we would pay off the rest of their loan. Um, so that is the current program for MA and LPN, right? Mm -hmm. Both of them, yeah. both That's programs. Great. At the same time, we would be paying for, for their time while they're at school as if they were working. And that's the biggest um, barrier that we found with these students uh, actually being able to either start their uh, education and in some cases, even completing it, we've, we've got a couple who are about halfway through and just could not afford to live anymore and had to, to drop out of the program. Um, so that, that's what we're helping them with. It sounds like a great program, especially in, in your region. It's really an important way to build a thriving economy. Um, another well, question we, I had is, oh, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to add to that, Dave. Um, you know, we really didn't touch on the, the one of the other problems we have around workforce is is, is housing. Yeah. And and housing is a tremendous mm -hmm. barrier to our ability to recruit people from out of the area. Um, um, and so uh, that you know, really compels ourselves. You know, we we are doing efforts. We are working in partnership with our community to to expand. Uh, housing development opportunities in the area. Um, there's some undeveloped land here on the hospital campus that we've committed to doing a housing development on. Um, that's a kind of a win-win because uh, we're trying to do this without putting hospital dollars into it, but using a hospital resource, undeveloped land, to support a development. Um, but uh, at the same time, it really pushes us into leaning into growing our own nursing workforce with the people who are already living here. And so I think that that's a real benefit for the for the people who, who live here in the, our communities already. That's great. That's great. It's a it's it's I think it's a challenge throughout the state throughout the region. And I think that's a, a, a good way to approach the solution. Um, you mentioned that you've had a pretty significant drop in 340B revenue. We've been hearing about this from multiple hospitals, but this year sounds substantially larger, $2 million over the course of a year. Is that what you mentioned, I believe? Could you describe uh, more? Or? Yeah, over over three years. Yeah. So it's, it's the, um, we've got two retail pharmacies in the area, uh, Kinney Drugs and Walgreens. 
Um, we also have uh, the FQHC that is uh, next to us who uh, they use a mail order uh, retail pharmacy. So that kind of dilutes some of it. Um, and the drugs uh, that are going through those retail are the drugs that the pharmaceuticals have been targeting to reduce for reimbursement. Um, and, and we also have had one of our pharmacies, Walgreens in St. Johnsbury, close uh, back in March. Um, and, and that's actually created some other pharmaceutical challenges for the patients in the area. Um, I've heard of, you know, up to four to five day waits to get their prescriptions filled, uh, which is a challenge. Okay. One, but that $2 million strategy, is, that's over, that's uh, combined over three years. That's two, not a, annualized. Right, right. That's from 2020 okay. to 2024. Okay, sorry, David, uh, it's not, yeah. yeah, we don't have anything built into this, uh, the FY24 budget, but uh, one thing that we are uh, exploring, it's really part of our strategic planning process, as well as working with communities to meet the need, but um, is we're, we're exploring the possibility of standing up our own retail pharmacy and NVRH branded retail pharmacy that would uh, really do two things. Uh, number one, and most importantly, is is reach this, um, fill the community need because we're down to one pharmacy here in the town of St. Jay and that pharmacy cannot keep up with the volume of scripts um, for the community. Uh, at, and number two is um, it's an effort to try to recapture uh, some of this lost uh, uh, 340B revenue. Um, I don't think we'll ever get back to where we were just a few short years ago, but, um, but, but it is an attempt to, to capture some of that. Okay. Um, one thing that stuck out to me in your narrative was uh, your labor cost tables on page six and page 20, which sort of have some similarities. Um, on page six, it looks like from 22 to 24, you've got nine FTs of general admin and seven FTs of hospital admin increased. Um, in patient care, you have about uh, uh, a total from Looks like 23 is down a little bit, but up up about a little fewer than that, about 14. Um, with total salary increases as seen on page 20, where you have about 2 million increase for those general admin and hospital admin and 2 million increase in the patient care. Um, you know, from, from our standpoint, we don't like to see ratios where admin is growing at the same amount as, as patient care. Could, could you um, co comment on this at all? You want to comment, Betty Ann? Do you have anything? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, without digging into that detail to comment. Um, Does this have to do with some of those reclassified positions? At uh, night. I think that that's part of it. Yeah, if you could look more into that. Also, it's the general and administrative on that page six, you have an 8.8% increase in the average salary and benefits per FTE, but in the clinical, it's only a 3.2%. And, and, you know, and again, you mentioned the 18% raise for nurses. So um, I'm just trying to understand what those, how to, how, to, how to think about what these like big general administrative salary increases with small clinical salary increases. Yeah, I don't think that, that we'll have to look into that. That doesn't make sense to us because the, the 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 investments we've been making and where we've really been pushing to keep up with market has been on the clinical uh, compensation side. So we're going to have to dig into that and get back to you. That that would be that'd be really helpful. Um, and then and then the one other thing I was looking at on Exhibit Ten. Which is the one that you resubmitted? Hold on, I gotta get up the resubmitted one here. Um, I was trying to understand, you know, there's when you actually exhibit nine uh, commercial in the net patient revenue fixed protection payments. Commercial revenue looks like when I just did it, it looked like it's about. Um, I get my percentages here. I think thirty-seven percent increase from. 22 to 24 in your commercial revenue. And I was looking down at exhibit 10, trying to figure out the breakdown of this. And it looks like, at least in the first group there in exhibit 10, where the uh, total 
change in NPR FEP for commercial uh, from budget 22 to 24 is like uh, nearly 12 million by rate and by utilization, it's only uh, 2.8 million from that same time frame. And I'm trying to understand that with when you have 11% projected increase in ED visit volume and 4% overall utilization projections, how you're, you know, that, that's going up so little compared to utilization and so much compared to rate, and if that's just reflective of the large rate ask. I would say that that is reflective of the large rate ask. Um, to, to, to dive into this deeper, we want to take it offline. There's a lot, a lot here. When you say offline, like follow up questions or follow up, yeah, yep. Or okay, yeah. I, I would love to understand this more because um, it, it, it seems that as you, if you have a lot of utilization growth, that maybe you you're good, you could um, cover some of this budget gap through utilization without doing it through rate, which does put a lot of pressure on on Vermont ratepayers. Uh, that's all I have for now. Thanks. I think I just have one or two. Um, on the uh, nursing challenges you've had and the staffing challenges you've had, they seem pretty acute compared to some other hospitals. You know, some have been quite successful, some have had less success in that realm. And I was wondering if you could speak to um, why we're seeing that kind of disparity and what you attribute the more uh, challenge, the higher level of challenges you've had. What do you attribute that to? Well, I'll start and then I'll let Julie and Betty Ann uh, fill in. I, I think part of it is probably demographics. Um, so, uh, you know, we shared that the, the, the Northeast Kingdom is the among the oldest region of the state of Vermont, right? And that, that also includes our working force. So when I started here in 2018, we did an analysis of our nursing workforce in particular. And in 2018, over 35% of our nursing workforce were baby boomers. Um, and then what we saw as we came through the pandemic is that um, many of those nursing professionals who maybe had planned to have an extended career or give a few extra years, um, many of them retired or left the nursing workforce uh, probably earlier than even they planned to, which uh, created a, a, a larger gap for us as we were coming through the pandemic. And I think it's just been uh, much more challenging for us to navigate our way out of that um, as, as we've come through the recovery. I don't know if Julie, you or Betty Ann have anything to add or thoughts? Uh, uh, trying to um, get people to move to the area. Um, so if we have a limited population of people who are nurses who are living in this area, um, some people are working here, and then others are working at um, the long-term care, as I said, and, and the nursing homes. Uh, some people travel to um, to Dartmouth, um, and um, and that's pretty much it. It's the the long-term care and the other um, healthcare organizations within this general area that are not hospitals. Um, and then Dartmouth is one of our main competitors um, for employers. Um, but um, so for, for this segment of people moving to the Northeast Kingdom, there are a lot of people who want to move here, but um, there are, the housing is limited and there is um, limited opportunity for that income level. Um, we don't have, you know, condo complexes. We don't have apartment complexes. If you move here, you are buying a house with uh, a parcel of land and at that income level, you're not gonna get like a single um, nurse to move here for that. So that's, so that's been a challenge as well. I'll just, uh, I, I know uh, Owen is somewhat anecdotal, but uh, we were trying to fill a position for, uh, it was actually an APR, uh, APRN in the ED this past spring. And we interviewed this person. They, they seemed like a perfect fit. They had family in the general area. So they wanted to be closer to family. They were an avid mountain biker and wanted to spend time on Kingdom Trails. They came to the Northeast Kingdom regularly to um, to um, for uh, you know for enjoyment of our outdoor activities. And 
um, as we were going through the process, we had great interviews. It looked really good. And at the end of the day, I asked him, I said, so what do you think? Does this, how's this looking for you? And he says, you know, Sean, this is, this is where I want to be. This seems like the, exactly the kind of institution I want to work for. But I'll be honest with you. I don't think I'll be able to find a place to live. Have you been on Zillow lately? So that night, I went out to Zillow. And this was back in, I don't know, March, April probably. And I, I did a search in like kind of within 15 mile radius of St. Johnsbury. And uh, I did a search for a house between, I think I put in 200,000 to $1 million. And once you took out like the raw land listings, there were less than, I think there were less than six houses on the market. And if you looked at them, half the houses, half of them, you'd look at and you'd know you have to put a quarter of a million dollars into because they were so bad in such bad shape. So that's, you know, that is just exacerbating these, these challenges we have. Hence our effort. What you see in this budget is our effort to really invest in our own workforce locally. And it, I take it, you know, I've been to St. Johnsbury. It's a lovely area. I encourage people to move to St. Johnsbury in the Northeast Kingdom. I love it. And I think people that do move there will also love it. Um, well, they're going to need their own motorhome. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't live there, but it is a nice place. <laughs> um, but I, is it your testimony that these issues that are in St. Johnsbury in your area are different than what you see in, you know, Brattleboro? Or, or Bennington or Morrisville or, or other places in Vermont in terms of the demographics and the housing challenges? You know, I, I can't speak to the housing challenges in those other areas. All I can really speak to is our own experience here in the Northeast Kingdom. Fair enough. And my last question, um, during the last hearing we had, uh, there was a public comment uh, and the observation from the public comment was that we, in the public commenters view we had too many hospitals and that there needs to be a reduction of around 154 beds statewide and as you know the act 167 work is getting underway and i was curious your view on um, that comment and then second um, whether or not if there was an opportunity to re reduce costs at your facility where would they be and what would you do if there was an opportunity. Uh, well, uh, I'll start with a co uh, uh, comment regarding the uh, the number of hospitals or number of beds in, um, in the state of Vermont. I can't speak to the rest of the state. All I know is what we have here in this community and what we need in this community. Now, uh, this hospital is our community hospital, and it is incredibly important that we serve our families, friends, and neighbors here. You know, this hospital is the hospital where my children were born, where my grandmother received her end of life care. I know the people in Northeast Kingdom. And if we didn't have these beds and these services here in the Northeast Kingdom, it would be incredibly challenging with the transportation system we have, with the weather we have, with the environment we have, to make sure that my family, friends, and neighbors got the care that they need and deserve. That's why these rural hospitals in these underserved areas are so incredibly important. I don't know, Owen, have you driven from Montpelier to St. Johnsbury since the flooding? I have not driven from St. Johnsbury to St. Johnsbury since the flooding. It, 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 Route 2 is a pretty rough road right now. Um, and, 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 you know, that, that you know, impacts access to health care services. Um, and, and I can't imagine, you know, we already have problems, you know, over the last two years, our ability to transport, uh, transfer critically ill patients to other, other uh, facilities, tertiary care facilities, Dartmouth, UVM has been extremely challenged because of their own uh, challenges with staffing um, and resources. And that doesn't even get into the issue around uh, EMS. We count on a strong and robust EMS system to do two things. Number one is when a person is having a traumatic event, whether it's a STEMI, whether it's a, a, a car accident, we count on a strong EMS to quickly respond and get the patient to our emergency room 
stable enough where we can provide life-saving care. Then we can get that patient quickly to a tertiary care facility, right? Well, with the challenges we've had on transferring patients, there are times when we're, we're, when we're tying up one of our EMS ambulances, sending a patient to Albany Medical Center. What is that, three and a half hours away, Mike? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Portland, um, Portland, Maine. Uh, Portland, Maine. Uh, we've sent them to Rhode Island, Hartford, Connecticut, Bay State, Springfield, Massachusetts. So you think about that. You take a truck out of our area for, you know, typically it would be a down and back to Bar Dartmouth, an hour down, half hour there, hour back. That's two and a half hours. Now we're sending that truck to Albany. That truck is out of our area for the entire day. That impacts care delivery. So what do you do, like, what are you going to do, beef up, you know, they can't find staff to, to staff uh, the ambulances. I mean, I mean, this is a, a knock-on, you know, they're knock-on effects to this. This bed base is critical to serving our community's health care needs. Now, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals around uh, uh, opportunities to cut, because we have put together, we trust this process, we have put together a budget that we believe meets this community's health care needs. We've developed that in conjunction with our board of directors that is made up of members of this community, and we feel that this is the right thing to meet those needs in this community. I would hate to speculate on what, um, what we would have to cut if, uh, if we had to. I don't have any other questions. Um, I'll turn it to the health care advocate. Thank you. Appreciate it. Uh, can folks hear me OK? Yep. Oh, great. Um, just a brief follow up on um, we appreciate uh, member Merman's line of questioning. We had similar cost concerns, but um, I want to follow up on Exhibit 9. Uh, Director Limber, if you wouldn't mind putting that up. It seems like you're projecting to increase your uncompensated care, particularly the bad debt. Um, for 24 budgeted relative to 22 and 21 actional. And we've heard from other hospitals around the Medicaid determination. I know you referenced that earlier, but I'm just wondering if you could expand a little bit about that projection and what went into that. I think that the projection is generally done um, based on our run rate. Um, we know that, uh, and this is most of the hospitals, I think, across the state where the free care has actually decreased especially through COVID for many reasons. Um, so it, it's, a, it's, it's based on what we're currently experiencing and then run out, um, you know, and part of it is also trying to get our navigators a little more engaged with our uh, patients who could potentially qualify for free care. And uh, Sam, I'm sure you've heard this a number of times from other hospitals, getting the, the patients to fill out the applications is, is our biggest challenge. Um, I, I've worked with with um, your colleague Mike Fisher uh, a few times on patients who have we have had issues getting uh, that information and sharing with him some of the challenges and he's 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 seen it firsthand. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, in your narrative, you talked a little bit about expanding your partnership with North Country um, and also working with the Office for Rural Health Access to do a regional develop your regional capacity and do a needs assessment. I'm just wondering if you could expand on that a little bit more. I know it's probably early stages, but I'm just curious what that will look like in practice. Well, uh, yeah, we're actually, um, so we've engaged through the Office of Real Health Access. Uh, we've engaged a consulting firm who's helping like really look at, you know, based on the area, the demographics, uh, the current capacity and what the current uh, healthcare services available are. And then matching that up with national benchmarks to determine um, what we what we need, what we need to grow. And um, it's it's we're, we're about 75 percent of the way through our analysis. North Country used the same um, uh, firm and did theirs. I think they got an update last year. And once we're both comp once ours is complete, we're going to uh, merge that information into um, into a, a complete picture for the Northeast Kingdom. Following on from that is really the, where the, the work is in, in, in exploring collaboratively how do we um, adapt and adjust to, to, to meet those needs that are identified as part of that analysis. Thank you. That's all we have. Sure. 
Um, were you able to leverage some of the magical funds that uh, John Olson helps provide to help pay for that? Okay, awesome. That that's just a really uh, uh, less less Santa Claus. John's been John's been great. It's, yeah, it's been yeah. really okay. helpful. <laughs> okay, that's great. Uh, yeah, for any other critical access hospitals that aren't aware, I think it is a really efficacious way to leverage some of that funding. So uh, sorry for the public service announcement. Oh, it's it's, it's been great, and yeah. Okay, um, any public comment? Seeing none, I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Tester and your team for any closing statements you may wanna leave with us. Um, I just want to thank you for the time today. I, we really do appreciate it, and uh, we look forward to uh, you know the conclusion of the whole process. We'll work uh, with uh, Sarah um, and follow up on, on some of those follow-ups that came out of today, and we'll try to turn that around for you as quickly as possible. Thank you. Great. Thank you all very much for the submission and presentation, and thank you, Director Lindbergh, to you and your team for another day of hard work and a lot of prep. Is there any old business to come before the board or new business? And is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 And we are adjourned. Thank you.